Now, then, now, then, now, then, now, then, then. Oh, oh I'm Jimmy Savile. Oi, oh, oi, yeah. And I'm Jimmy Savile. And we're running the London Marathon. Mm. I hope nobody dies. If they do, Bagsy, I take them to the mortuary. How's about that then, guys and girls? Wake up! Get out of bed, put on your clothes Another day is dawning Turn on your TV Time to watch this morning With Richard and Judy Oh, better not worse, it's live, not rehearsed Made for no money, not for anybody Welcome your host, say, oh, Richard Do they have no idea? So let's see how they do on this morning With Richard Stuart Lee. And my name is Rio, and I dance upon the sand. Now, is, is your name Rio? Listen to the question, the words in it, is your name Rio? It's Rio Chard Herring. Is it? <laughs> no, it's Richard Herring. And where, where do you dance? On my own, in Balham, in my pants. Good. <laughs> you always spoil everything I do. And in honour of the House of Lords' resistance to lowering the homosexual age of consent, this week on TMWRNJ, is Gay Week, and coming up later in the show... At 12.25, we'll be meeting Vinnie Jones, the exception that proves the rule that everyone is at least partially gay. <laughs> there isn't a gay bone in his body. And at 12.34, we'll be lowering the gay age of consent to 16, but only for 15 minutes, before raising it back to 18 again, and then seeing if society has collapsed into chaos and anarchy, or whether, in fact, it hasn't really made much difference at all, to be quite honest. At 12.42, Rupert Everett will be explaining why he is the ideal husband for Prince Edward. <laughs> and at 12.50, we'll be meeting Britain's gayest shepherd. Let's have a look at him there. There he is there. Doesn't, doesn't look particularly gay, For a Steve. shepherd, Richard. How do you yeah. quantify gay? And uh, please oh, welcome, right. at the piano, Richard Thomas. Thank you, Richard. Hello. 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 Rich. Rich, what happened to you? I've never been to a harvester before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Us. Brilliant. Dear Five Friday is filmed next door to it. We see Chris Evans around, don't we? Sometimes, see sometimes. Yeah. He's a, yeah. I tell you, he is a monster. A monster. Rich saying it in a staccato fashion doesn't make it any more true. He's a monster, my thing. Rich saying it in a Mexican bandit accent doesn't make it any more true. What's he done, anyway? I'll tell you what he done, Steve. He had dug up the grave of John Lennon and was having a one-to-one -one with him. <laughs> In what sense? Well, Stu, he was giving the corpse compliments, yeah. which were obviously just thinly veiled references to how good Chris Evans himself thinks he is. Oh, yeah. And then when he thought no one was looking, he weed on Lennon's corpse. Really? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think of that? Predictable. What do you think? <laughs> said my daughter the other day, <laughs> whilst giving birth. <laughs> ah, my poor fool, I said, for it is written that pain in childbirth is God's punishment to women for Eve's betrayal of God in Eden, and therefore you deserve every scintilla of agony you are experiencing, O oh, Orish spawn of mine, <laughs> and thus, justly chastised, did she complain more quietly. Tell me, Stu, what have you been up to this week? Well, this week I avoided queuing for up to 18 hours to see the Royal Academy's Monet exhibition by buying some water lilies, putting them in my bath, then getting really drunk, smearing wallpaper glue on my hands and squinting at the lilies through my paste-smeared fingers. Gee, I don't think that's really comparable to the way that Monet captured the inner life of the Gavinci garden flowers with his innovative impressionistic use of colour and light and by association does discover what we might describe as a genuinely new way of seeing. Um, I think we must have read each other's bits on the autocue there. So oh, yeah, we did, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, these are... These lilies, Stu, yeah. did you consider them at all? No, I didn't, know. Okay. Now, um, what, have you, what have you been up to this week, Rich? Well, Stu, I was messing around by the old canal. Of oh, course. Yeah. I, only, I only ended up with rat syphilis. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fell in, did you? No, Stu, I think you've misunderstood what right. I'm saying. Uh, I started uh, hanging around with some of the rats there. One thing led to another. You are sick, you I'm sick. not, Stu. I like all different kinds of rats. I'm not prejudiced. Black rats, masked rats, Gambian giant pouch rats. Of course, they're all giant pouch rats by the time I've finished with them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
Man Black and Mask, come to think of it. And now, <laughs> the return of an old friend. Oh, yes, oh, yes. Hear ye, hear ye, with your hobby ears. I am Simon Quinlack, and welcome to my hobby world of hobbies. I love doing hobbies, and I'm the best at doing hobbies also. I am. What you will need for this week's hobby? A public house, a gullible man, a flask of weak lemon drink, and a plastic bag full of different pieces of fruit. This hobby is a good hobby if you like fruit and getting free money off gullible members of the public. This hobby is called the Real Fruit Fruit Machine with Reels of Real Fruit Hobby. How to do this week's hobby. First of all, find a gullible man who enjoys playing a fruit machine, like this one. Hello, are you a gullible man? Answer me! No. Oh, I think you are. Why are you watching false fruit spinning on the reels when you could be looking at real fruit or my real food fruit machine with reels of real fruit? Pardon? I think you heard me, Mr. Fruit. If you give me a pound and I give you three pieces of fruit the same, you could double your money. All right, I'll go for that. Oh, you can't even see the trick. Pull my arm. Do it! Ooh, an apple. Oh, another apple. Drink your weak lemon drink. Now! Would you like some? Yeah. I bet you would. <laughs> oh dear, an orange. You lose and I win a pound. Ha ha ha! You gullible man! Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> There's about 20 quid's worth of fresh fruit in here. Great! Today, I have tricked over ten gullible men with my trick real fruit fruit machine with reels of real fruit hobby trick, proving once and for all that I am the king of all men and the lord of all hobbies. Bye. Hello, I'm Baroness Young, the House of Lords homophobic Harridan. I will not rest until all joy in love is extinguished on the planet Earth. <laughs> good satire, Rich. Good yeah, mask work thanks, there. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, of course, if they do uh, make it legal to have gay sex with 16-year-olds, there won't be anyone left in the Houses of Parliament. I'm yeah, afraid. that's because all MPs are gay. Every single God, MP so... is gay. No, it's like Ron Davis do. Yeah. You know Ron Davis. Yeah. Uh, I've, I don't call him Ron Davis like he wants me to. Right. I've got a clever Rory Bremner-style satirical name for him, Stu. I call him Ron Gavis. That is, stop. <laughs> that is so... The lowest form of wit, Rich, changing people's names to something it sounds like weak. Au contraire. Right. It is the highest form of wit, Stu. It's like Thackeray and Rory Bremner. You know uh, Michael Portillo, Stu? Yeah. Ah-ha! You know Michael Portillo! Ah-ha! 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 I don't... I know who he is. I don't see what's funny about that. Ah-ha! You know Michael Portillo! Now it's time ah for this week's ah Aims. Ah Aim one is to predict, try and predict which will last longer, Jerry Spicy's solo career or the marriage of Post Spice and David Beckham. Aim two is to live to see the day when the US Air Force will take part in a war without bombing people who are on their own side. <laughs> Aim three is to have the five Lawrence murder suspects castrated with blunt butter knives, disemboweled and pulled apart by wild horses. You can't say that, Richard. It's banter, Martin, harmless banter. <laughs> Aim four is to ask House of Lords Harridan Baroness Young if she'll be happier to let 16-year-old boys have gay sex if she's allowed to watch. <laughs> and aim five is to pass a law making it compulsory for 16-year-old boys to have sex with Baroness Young. 24 hours a day, every day, until she finally cheers up and stops spoiling everyone else's fun, the miserable, dried-up old cow. <laughs> Crack your face, Grandma! Rich, you, you can't say that. She's the, she's the vice president of the Board of Governors of the BBC. Is she? Yeah. It was banter, Martin, harmless it's too banter. Late for that. <laughs> King Canute tried to defy the forces of gravity by insisting he could turn back the tides. Today we laugh at the absurd monarch. But are we really any better than he? Hi, I'm Greg Evigan, Robert Russo in TV's Pacific Palisades. If you have ever wondered what happens when things fall over, spill, or get knocked out of cupboards, then join me now and see what they are. When things get knocked over, spill, or fall out of cupboards. This week, be truth. Again. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, just going to make Tim his tea. Um, the usual access day special, sardines on toast and a waitrose mousse. 
And, well, I'd had a few drinks. Um, well, it's coming on to six o'clock. I reached up to uh, the top cupboard and I accidentally knocked one of my beetroot jars on Tim's head. <laughs> I mean, he's always getting in the way under my feet. Anyway, we hit it and boom, bang onto the floor. Boom. Boom. And it was, uh, let me tell you, it was very odd, because I, I looked at him for a moment lying there, and I, and I thought to myself, um, I really hope he's dead. <laughs> I hope he's dead. <laughs> and then I started laughing. And, and thinking that would be the one thing that would really upset his mother. And I thought of Margaret standing there, <laughs> crying over his grave. <laughs> anyway, um, Tim got up and I sat down. He was fit as a pie. It was a very strange moment for me, really. Cue me. Peter Norman and Tim Gibbs Norman thought that they too could defy gravity like a pair of stupid canutes. But tiny Tim Gibbs Norman's beetroot battered head bears mute witness to the unstoppable forces that are unleashed when some beetroot combines with the force of gravity and then becomes one of the things that get knocked over, spill, or fall out of cupboards. I'm Greg Evigan. Goodbye. I made this. Now, once again, let's prepare to choose the king or queen of this week's show. So, please welcome our slaves who are both actually taking part in today's London Marathon, raising money to pay someone to have sex with Baroness Young. It's Trevor and Nathalie! Trevor and Nathalie coming down the stairs. Look at them! Trevor and Nathalie. They're dressed as hilarious fancy dress London Marathon runners. <laughs> Don't give up now, Trevor. You've come so far. Trevor. A small faced man this week dressed as a frog. You know, Trevor, your face is so small, there are actual real frogs with bigger faces than you. <laughs> Leave him, Stu. And of course, the king of the show will get whatever they desire from this the Jimmy Savile trolley of athletics and death. <laughs> you and you and you and you. <laughs> And the trolley today loaded with products that are essential for marathon athletes. Look, Stu, one of those trendy new isotronic drinks, Stu. Oh, oh very brackish. No, Rich. <laughs> this is the isotonic drink. What? Oh, it's still quite nice. Right. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, then we've got the, uh, bre the athlete's breakfast cereal of choice, Sustain, which is actually the only cereal made of pure Viagra. Rich, don't eat that. Viagra is a drug. It isn't, Stu. No British athlete would ever take drugs, Stu. And we'll be choosing the king or queen of the show after this. Ah! There are peas coming out of my winky! <laughs> Mr Grimsdale! <laughs> were amazing times for comedy. We changed, changed the comedy landscape. Algernon nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of people have uh, have done that nerd character after me. Uh, I'm thinking of Norm from the Twix adverts played by the actor Kevin Eldon, but I was the first, I believe. I'm doing the shopping for my mum. <laughs> I'm doing the shopping for my mum. Of course, it became a bit of a national catchphrase, like bit of a cross for me to bear. A gang of youths uh, attacked a boy in Leicester with learning difficulties. Uh, quite a nasty scene, but it's not my fault. Don't don't blame the messenger. You know, I was I was trying to transfer comedy from the mother-in-law jokes of the 70s to people who were socially inadequate. You know, who let's face it, were going to get bullied anyway. I wasn't doing <laughs> any harm at all there. I like train spotting. <laughs> I'm doing the shopping for my mum. Yeah, yeah. She's packed me some meat paste sandwiches and some monster munch. Mm. Pickled onion, my favourite. <laughs> uh, I did have to kill him off. 
in the end it just got too much old Algernon. <laughs> just got boring, yeah. you know, I have to move on. I'm doing the shopping for my mum. That's it. I'm doing a new character now. Uh, Archibald Nathman. A Nathman. <laughs> he likes the internet, you know, space stuff. It's more 90s, yeah. Mum, have you taped Star Trek for me? <laughs> That's what he says, you see. It's, you can see how, how I've moved on. Amazing times. Mm. <laughs> and I'm here with three more ordinary members of the public who long in their hearts to be the king or queen of the show. Um, what's, what's your name here? Sally Herworth. Yeah. And you say you should be king or queen of the show. Or queen. Because... <laughs> Your dad used to get drunk with Oliver Reed. That's right. Yeah, it doesn't really narrow it down, though, does it? <laughs> we'll see. And, um... Your name is...? Sparky. Sparky. You can see why, can't you, Stuart? Yeah. <laughs> I should be king of the show because I have wooden eyes. Yep. Do you have wooden eyes? No. It was no. a ruse to get on TV. Well, it worked, didn't oh, it? Yeah. But you fell at the last hurdle. <laughs> you should have brassed it out a bit, you know. Wouldn't it? And finally, what's your name? Jeanette. Jeanette what? Muff. <laughs> Uh, and you say she should be king of the show or queen because of the potential comedic double entendre effect of my surname. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have checked, it is about. her real name, but... Because it's also a thing you can put your hands in like that to keep... Move on. <laughs> uh, now, the studio audience! <laughs> You're making up your own jokes now, as Les Dennis would say. Now, the studio audience will democratically choose their monarch with the aid of our Jimmy Savalometer. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. How about that then, now then, now then? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, if you like number one whose dad drank with Oliver Reed, applaud now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Jimmy Savile is going up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jack Watkins there. Now then, now then. If you like number two who lied about having wooden eyes, <laughs> applaud now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the Jimmy Savile is going up. Into the 70s there. And if you like number three, who oh, you obviously will win, <laughs> Jeanette Muff, applaud now. Queen Jeanette, <laughs> any early pronouncements at this stage? I'd like to replace Milton Keynes with a giant bouncy count mm. castle. Well, that's very good. The Queen or King has spoken. <laughs> Give a round of applause. <laughs> And this week on Lazy Comedy Slags, the art of the great British sitcom. Now, American sitcom writers waste their time thinking up complex characters and plots. All you need for a great sitcom is a title that is a pun based around the situation of the con, or, if you can't think of one, the name of one of the characters. And the rest will write itself. That's right. Now, all British sitcoms are thought up by the BBC head of sitcoms, Geoffrey Merkin Warbeck. There he is there. <laughs> who lives literally in an ivory tower in Oxford. What, a tower made of ivory? Yeah, which plucked from elephants' howling faces. Oh. And <laughs> here are some of the sitcoms currently in production at the BBC. First one here. Roll Reversal. Ian Roll is a driving instructor. Ian Reversal is a baker. Due to some kind of accident, they're forced to swap jobs with hilarious consequences. That's all there is for Simple and brilliant, Stu. Knock Seinfeld into a cocked hat. Uh, here's another one. Pie in the Sky. Uh, Ian Pie is the landlord of the Sky Pub. In an attempt to attract custom, each week he buys a different giant pie, which goes rotten and ironically scares the public away. 
with hilarious consequences. <laughs> my cup upstairs. Ian Mai lives in a flat. His upstairs neighbour borrows one of his cups and then doesn't return it. The series details Ian Mai's contrived and failed attempts to get back the cup that is rightfully his. Sounds like a winner to me, Stu. Uh, here's another one, Babes in the Wood. Uh, this is two babies live in a piece of wood. Uh, simple, brilliant, isn't it, Stu? Yep. Ian Chalk. Uh, this is called Chalk and Cheese. Ian Chalk and Ian Cheese are two men. They are very different. As different, <laughs> literally, as chalk and cheese. Uh, consequently, they don't really get on, but occasionally they do something which makes them realise they're more similar than they initially thought, and then Ian Cheese falls into a stream to break the seriousness of the moment. Very good. <laughs> Finally, for the moment, Bent Coppers. Uh, Ian and Ian Bent are brothers, and they're both policemen. One is corrupt, and one is gay. <laughs> Both of them are afflicted by curvature of the spine. <laughs> and they're made of copper. <laughs> they're robots in the future. And we're bringing you more of these sitcoms from the discard pile throughout the show. Hello, you uh, just caught me lapping up some milk. <laughs> Don't worry, puss. I wasn't drinking your milk. But I am now. <laughs> oh, lovely. <laughs> We've had a lot of fun there. But milk is no laughing matter, especially in this day and age when man's stupidity is wiping out so many milk-giving species. Which something you might like to consider while well, I drink this week's milk, quagga milk. When a white European huntsman killed the last quagga in 1884, he probably didn't even stop to consider that he was depriving future generations of quagga milk. <laughs> Mixing horse and zebra milk together may give us some idea, but fortunately a few rare bottles of quagga milk have survived. And at £13,000 a bottle, only me and Johnny Depp can afford to drink it. Let's give it a go. Ooh, it's an unusual texture. And the taste? Oh, God, that's disgusting! Oh, quagga milk is, oh, horrible! And the Victorians were right to kill them all for that reason alone. Not out of ten, quagga. There'll always be milk, unfortunately, in this case. Oh. I know about sitcoms here. This one's called Eye on the Bull. Uh, Adam I, who used to do the video game reviews on Live and Kicking, loses his two legs in an accident. Zoe Ball feels guilty that he was sacked and so offers to carry him around on her back. <laughs> Thus, he is literally I on the ball. <laughs> and there's a note here, if Zoe not available, Johnny Ball definitely is. <laughs> What's the matter, Rich? Got an itch there? Yeah, you know, I, th I think it might be. I was up in the old church belfry at the weekend. Oh, and... yeah. Fiberglass lagging. No, no, Stu, I've got bat gonorrhea. Oh, right. <laughs> like rat syphilis. It's got very different symptoms, You Stu. are sick. I'm not, are... Stu. I like all kinds of bats. Horseshoe bats, vampire bats, fruit bats. Of course, they're all fruit bats by the time I finish with them. <laughs> what do you mean? Hey, now, <laughs> staying with the fruit theme, it's time to meet someone with a bit of explaining to do. Please welcome the Curious Orange. Hello, Mr. Stu. I'm Curious Orange. Um, <laughs> what are you curious about this week, I wonder? Well, Mr. Oh, Rich... Hey, I'm, I'm curious about something, right? What happened to the little boy? At the end of last week's show, there was a little boy, you attacked him. What happened? Hurt his liver with fava beans and a nice Chianti. <laughs> <laughs> look, look, we have got few enough viewers as it is, the Curious Orange, without you killing them. You know? oh, I'm sorry. I promise oh, I won't do it again. Well, <laughs> all right. We're all allowed one mistake, I think. <laughs> killing a child? Stu, have some forgiveness. Be more like Jesus and me. <laughs> what, what are you curious about this week? I'm very curious, curious about this little conundrum. What became of your beaver, Mr. Rich? What? The beaver you drank milk from last week. What became of it? They, they killed it. You still wake up sometimes, don't you? Wake up in the dark and hear the screaming of the beavers. Yes. 
And you think if you can satisfy my curiosity, you can make them starve, don't you? If my curiosity is sated, you won't wake up in the dark to the awful screaming of the beavers. I don't know. I don't know. Thank you, Mr. Ridge. <laughs> <laughs> and is your curiosity satisfied now, the curious orange? No! Oh, oh, never satisfy me, Mr. Stew! Never! Not until you are dead in your grave! And one day you oh. shall all see my power! Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how are you going to get out of that mask? Oh, I'll think of something. Uh, can I borrow a pen, please, for a minute? Yeah, sure, there you are. Ladies and gentlemen, the Curious Orange! <laughs> and so you see how I, the Son of God, remember, am allowing this woman of sinful life to kiss my foot. Ah. ah. Not going ah, Matthew. What ails you? I can't understand this, Lord. I have tried hard. <coughs> hard. <laughs> <laughs> Don't laugh, Judas. It's obvious what he meant. If you truly are a prophet, then why are you allowing this sinful yeah, woman to touch you? Go on, Nicky. Hey, what? Why are you allowing this sinful woman to touch you? Ah, oh, Matthew, my poor fool. Do you not see? Ah. Oh. <laughs> what? Don't you understand, Matthew? I did. It's easy peasy pudding and pie. Shut up. <laughs> Matthew, the great love that this woman has shown shows that she has been forgiven much, whereas he who has been forgiven little may show only a little love. Ah. Oh. No, no. It isn't, because I haven't committed any sins, and yet you're ignoring me and just paying all attention to her. Matthew. When I came round to your house, you did not give me water for my foot. Ah. No, ah. ah. No, it isn't. I didn't know you wanted water for well, your I foot. Did. If you'd wanted foot water, you should have asked for it. Ah. You know, I'm not telepathic, am I, ah. Jesus? You know, you know, it's not the first thing that springs to mind. I better get him some foot water. Ah. You know, I just didn't think of that. Matthew, unlike you, this woman of sinful life has bathed my foot with her very tears. Ah. Well, you know, she's probably one of those people who can cry at will, isn't she? I'm not. I never cry anything normally. Well, maybe it's her time of the month. She's all emotional. <laughs> sexist, isn't it, Jesus? What Matthew just yes, said. Yes, Peter is. It's yeah, sexist. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew, unlike <laughs> you, this woman of sinful life washed my foot with her tears and dried it with her very hair. Ah. No, not ah. It's easy for her to dry your foot with her hair. She's got really long hair, hasn't she? I've only got short hair, look. It's not my fault. Well, I'd have to short. get down on the floor and sort of roll oh, up and me. down your foot like that, like yeah. some kind of human head-sized shoe polish rag. Ah. No, no, not ah. ah. I am not a tea towel. I am. I'm a hair tea towel, look. Stop doing that to Jesus. Ah. I just think it's a bit convenient, isn't it? You suddenly come up with this, no. that who has sinned much is forgiven a lot. Just as it happens, a, a woman comes along bathing your feet with her hair, that's all. It isn't. It is? Now, answer my question, the point I'm addressing. Consider this piece of naan bread. Not this again. <laughs> look, look, like screw it. Screw up the bread, that's it. I've had enough of this, I'm off. <laughs> Um, can I stop now? Well, just lick that in there. Some <laughs> new sitcoms again in development at the BBC. Um, this one's called Fruit and Nut. Ian Fruit, a flamboyant elderly raconteur, shares a flat with Ian Nut a dangerous schizophrenic who has escaped from Broadmoor. <laughs> Ian Fruit can only eat nuts. Ian Nut can only eat fruit. <laughs> but they're both allergic to fruit and nut chocolate. As Ian Nut is mad, he always secretly puts fruit and nut chocolate in everything they eat, with fatal consequences. <laughs> another one, uh, honey, I swallowed some semen. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Rick Moranis plays a hapless professor who accidentally turns himself into a killer whale. Oh, right. Each week he attacks a ship and eats some sailors. <laughs> and then he gets off the bus nice. that night. <laughs> Sir 
Saving Private Ryan, current plot. The moving story of a unit of American soldiers who reluctantly risk their lives to locate Private Ryan so he can be sent home to his mother. Many of them lay down their lives, but Ryan is safe. Finally, an elderly Private Ryan goes with his wife, children and grandchildren to kneel and pay tribute at Tom Hanks' grave. With tears flooding down his cheeks, he turns to his wife and says, Have I lived a good life? Extra final scene. Have I been a good man? Well, no, Jack. To be honest, you ain't. You've grown up from a stupid, chubby, empty-headed young boy into a fat, dull old man in a blue zip-up coat. Name one thing you've ever achieved in your so-called life. Just one. See, there ain't nothing, Jack. I kind of wish that Tom Hanks character had been saved. He at least looked like he was going to do something worthwhile. You never even got round to putting those shelves up in the garage. Oh, and the kids ain't yours. I had an affair with a German prisoner of war. Oh. And mighty fine he was too, my friend. So, oh, your brothers is dead. Your genes ain't been passed on. And all your little friends were killed trying to save you. No. And by the way, Jack, I think Hitler was right. <laughs> Bumblebees. Of course, they're all bumblebees by the time I finish with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're here with uh, Queen Jeanette Muff, who is a real person. Uh, Jeanette, I suppose you're commissioning sitcoms. What do you reckon to this idea? This is called uh, Meno Pause. Uh, it's about cats who can talk going through the change of life. Possible Eddie Izzard vehicle, we thought. Um, <laughs> anyway, what's up next? If you want to be uh, King of the Show next week, send in a sitcom idea, and uh, not more than 50 words, and uh, if you get the best one, you'll be the King of the Show next week. Uh, I wonder who'll win, I don't know. Of course, uh, our next guest, who is a man, does know. It's 16th century doctor and mystic Nostradamus on his horse, David Collins! <laughs> Nostradamus. Hello, Ridgewell. Oh, wow. Oh, he's flighty there. today, isn't he? Oh, David? he's very flighty. Particularly flighty, I very think. Uh, anyway, first, let's take a look at your three predictions from last week. Remember, uh, if you get two out of three of these right, you will go home with this lovely garden barbecue. Oh. Nice visual pun. <laughs> oh, can I have the fence and all? I look lovely on my patio. No. Oh. Now, Nostradamus, come on, let's have a look at the board. Don't leave him alone. Don't take any care. Are you nervous? No, I'm very confident. Okay. Right. Last week you predicted that a very flighty, flighty. A actress yep. would make a spectacle of herself at the BAFTA Baftas. Awards. The news said, <laughs> "Yep, we're going to give it to you." Elizabeth Taylor was rather foolish on the subject of quarantine and Britain being yes, a homeland. So. That's, that's a bit, yes, you know, liberal interpretation. He's going to get them all if you're going to be that. Stu, when will you stop with this jealousy? Okay, come on, okay, David. Okay, come okay, on, he's not okay, worth okay. it. Leave him alone, David. Second, come on, David Collins. Look at the board. Second, you said. That Margaret, Lady Margaret Thatcher, Thatcher. would die. die. <laughs> the news said, <coughs> no. Uh, unfortunately, she still lives. I'm afraid. No, no. It, it was banter, Martin. Just harmless banter. <laughs> this is hardly the place for banter now, Nostradamus. No. Damn you! And Lee. that's a uh, Chinese burn for you, Nostradamus. Ow, ow. Yeah. Anyway, wasn't 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 Nostradamus French anyway? No, he was Welsh. I mean, I was Welsh. I mean, I am Welsh. I'm from Turkey. You're a very stupid man. <laughs> Finally, come on, you three. Come on, just, okay, just be friends. Okay. Share things nicely. Finally, you said that the great fish, fish. will come to complain and weep, weep, and then it will rain Day. on Friday. The news said... <coughs> no, oh, that's wrong, I'm afraid. No, I was talking in code. The great fish is fish from Marillion, who complained and wept about the mixed reviews he got for his new album, River Gods and Zippos. Even a monkey would know that. No, no, no. <laughs> It did rain on Friday, though. Yeah, it did rain on Friday. You're wrong. Smash the barbecue. <laughs> oh, what a world! And oh. Another Chinese burn for you, Nostradamus. And a nasty love bite. Oh, it's smart. Oh. But I like it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Stu, when I look at Nostradamus, I, I feel all funny in my tummy. Move quickly on. <laughs> anyway, Nostradamus, um, what are your predictions for the coming week? Well, prediction number one. A cartoon will appear in a national newspaper of a recently deceased celebrity arriving at the pearly gates. <laughs> prediction number two. The comedian, Stuart Lee, will be trampled by a horse, and maybe then he won't think he's so clever. <laughs> and prediction number three. They will think they have seen the sun at night when they see the half-pig man and one will hear brute beasts speak in. <laughs> and, uh, can you come back next week to see if you got those right, Nostradamus? Oh, hang on. I'll just, uh, check my diary now. OK. Yeah, I can move that. OK, yeah, we'll see you then. <laughs> right. Ladies and gentlemen, Nostradamus and his horse, David Colley. <laughs> there we go. He's, uh, he's nice, isn't he, Nostradamus? Makes me feel good. A vast shipmate, prepared to bring aboard the bounty. Oh, hello, children. It's me, Histor. The crow that you know will make history so interesting. Here you are, Histor. Huh? What's this? It is a bounty. You asked me to bring aboard a bounty. And so here it is, the Bounty Chocolate Sweet Meat. No, I'm sorry, that is just rubbish. Rubbish, like a rubbish dump where birds might live, possibly. No, stop that, it's pathetic. Does it really come to doing a bounty joke? Well, there's only so many, you know, pirate stroke nautical terms to misinterpret. Even so. Anyway, what's the news, Histor? Well, you may have heard on the grown-up news... grown-up news. ...that people are running a marathon. Like a marathon, another chocolate bar. They're called Snickers Knickers, now. like a bird's <laughs> knickers. What is a marathon, Histor? I've never heard of it before. To find that out, let's fly back in time as the crow flies. Fly back in egg as the egg eggs egg. <laughs> This is this, Histor. This is ancient Greece. A hen's Greece. And look, Pliny, we are about to see the first man who ever ran a marathon. Ah, you must be referring to the messenger who ran from Marathon to Athens in 490 BC to warn of the imminent naval attack on the city. No, Pliny, don't be stupid. I am referring to <laughs> him. Oh, oh, oh. Kai Histor, yes, it's me, Bernie Clifton. I am him. <laughs> and this is my ostrich. <laughs> ostrich, like a bird, the ostrich. Yes, here running the first ever marathon for the disadvantaged. Disadvantaged. Uh, raising money for the disadvantaged children in the slums of ancient Athens. Hey, hens. That is very nice of you, Bernie. Oh, don't thank me. <laughs> thank the ostrich. He's doing all the running. <laughs> hey, quick. Goodbye, Bernie, and good luck. Goodbye. <laughs> And every year since then, Bernie Clifton has run the nominal distance of just over 26 miles in order to help those less fortunate than him. And every year he's made the joke... The yoke, like a bird's yoke, a egg yoke. About the ostrich. Ostrich, like an ostrich. Doing all the running. The run wing, like a bird's wing. Now, Billy, have you brought aboard the bounty yet? Yes! What? Why are we sinking? Because I have brought aboard the bounty, the historical ship on which Feather Christian mutinied against Captain Bly, uh, like Captain Bird's Eye, like a bird's eye. Well, this whole week strip's been, been just terrible. Well, I think it's been all right, really. Goodbye, children, goodbye. It hasn't. It's been... I've been embarrassed about... Well, just try and look like you're sinking. Oh, stupid. <laughs> Will you, will you stop doing that, right? Trying to look like Robbie Williams won't make Andrea Corr fancy you, do you understand? I'm not trying to do that, Stu. You are nowhere near as cool as him, right? Robbie Williams, he's got tattoos and everything. Apparently, yeah, he's got a tattoo, Robbie Williams. Apparently, it symbolises his life story. It's a long black line that starts at the base of his neck, then erratically gets fatter and thinner until finally it disappears up his bum. Lay off him, Stu. It's good what he's done, that no, tattoo. I, I think it's, it's irresponsible. What if one of his impressionable fans tries to get a tattoo to copy him. No-one's gonna do that, Stu. 
Let's see it then. Well, all right, then. I didn't get a tattoo to copy, Mr. I just like, wanted one. I thought it'd be good. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that supposed to be? That, Stu, it's Robbie Williams. There, what, you're saying... You're saying you don't idolise Robbie Williams, right? But you've had a tattoo done, like Robbie Williams yeah. did. Yeah. And it's a tattoo of Robbie Williams. Yeah. And over the top it says, I idolise Robbie Williams and want to be exactly like him. That isn't idolising him, Stu. Look, Stu, he's singing. Ooh, <laughs> millennia. Um, who, who did that, anyway? Who did it? I did it myself, Stu, with a rusty pin and a felt tip. Well, you should have... You should have copied it off a better picture. It doesn't look anything like I him. I didn't copy it off a picture, Stu. I did it from life. Well, you'd think it'd look more like him, then. Well, you know, I couldn't see what I was doing, could I, Stu? It was dark, and his face was all scrunched up on the pillow. <laughs> then I got thrown out of the hotel. <laughs> ah. Which, you've embarrassed me. You've embarrassed this audience. You've embarrassed the actor, Kevin Eldon. I haven't. Yeah, you're embarrassed, aren't you, Kev? Well, yes. See? But most of all, <laughs> you've embarrassed yourself. Curse you, God, for making me this way. Why? Shall a horse that has followed the word of God be admitted to heaven? Yes. Gladly. And shall a zebra, or zebra if you will, that has acted likewise, also find succour? Of course. But a quagga shall never enter. <laughs> Do not question the ways of the Lord. All right? <laughs> What's the matter, Rich? Are you itchy? Yeah, I think it must be a problem. I was messing around by the messing about by the estuary. You oh know. yeah. Fell in, did you? No, Stu, I've got eel non-specific urethritis. Yeah. <laughs> it's worse than that, Stu. I also got blue whale herpes. Yeah. Didn't, didn't, you, didn't you use protection, Rich? I used the eel as protection, Stu. Yeah. <laughs> did it have a kite mark? They've all got kite marks by the time I've finished with them, Stu. It doesn't make any sense. They laughed at it, Stu. That's all that counts. All right, you're, you are sick. I'm not, Stu. I like all whales. Killer whales, gnar whales. Sperm whales, is it? They're all sperm whales by the time I've finished with them. Is that what it is? Oh, ha, ha. No, it's, it isn't. It's humpback whales. Oh, They're all humpback <laughs> Damn. Yeah, that's all for this week. Uh, Remember, we can... King of the... uh, you can uh, write to us at this address here if you want. And there's the email addresses coming up and also the website address there with all... You can uh, access... Access that for behind-the-scenes information. Uh, behind-the-scenes thing, yeah. So, uh, just look at another sitcom coming guys, up Guys! Guys! Terrible news! What? what? It's the orange! He's escaped again! How is that possible? He picked the lock with a pen. Oh. And he's attacked the guard and he's barely alive! Look! Oh, my God! Get, get that man to a hospital. He must be saved. Goodbye. Bye. You must be very proud.